My name is John Gibbon. I'm in the Mathematics Department, Imperial College London. Uh, my name is Jean-Luc Tifo. I'm in the Math Department at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. My name is Rahul Pandit. I am in the Physics Department at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. The, the title of the workshop contains these sort of words in light, fluid turbulence, and I think it's fair to say that the general public intuitively recognises and that the idea of turbulence. They see these great weather patterns on the weather forecasts. They see a turbulent flow coming out of, the, of their bath taps. And they sort of understand this idea of unpredictability. Uh, even Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks from 500 years ago have sketches of turbulent waterfalls. Um, but what I think the public doesn't really realize is that turbulent motions occur over vastly different scales. Uh, for instance, in the atmosphere, you're talking about scales of a thousand kilometers. In the oceans, maybe hundreds of kilometers. In your bathtub, it would be about one centimeter. And there are fluid, turbulent scales down to millimeters in, in certain flows. And then at the other end, in astrophysical scales, you're talking about hundreds of millions of kilometers. So turbulence is a phenomenon that occurs everywhere. Uh, and many areas, most areas of physics, engineering, biology, and even the stock market, as we people see. And you'll find groups studying it in mathematics, physics, biology departments, aeronautics, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, atmospheric and ocean sciences departments. Um, I think that the topic is so great and it's of such generality that it's far too wide for just one program. And so the task of this program is basically concentrating on the mathematical aspects of turbulence. We want to narrow it down to that. So we might, I've used this word problem, so we might ask why is it a problem? Well, the, it's this, that the mathematical equations that govern the motion of a fluid, there's two of them. The first to call the Euler equations. A Swiss guy called Leonard Euler wrote down these equations in 1757. And they represent a fluid that doesn't have any viscosity. In other words, no stickiness. And then for a fluid with stickiness, you're talking about the Navier-Stokes equations that were written down in the 1820s or 1830s. And neither of these are really wholly understood. There are many major problems. And there are fundamental mathematical difficulties that haven't been resolved. And despite probably 90 years of modern analysis and huge modern computing resources, there are great holes in our understanding. Let me give you an example. Uh, we have a thing in our business called the Reynolds number of a flow. And the Reynolds number is essentially a dimensionless number that, that represents the velocity of a fluid with respect to how, how viscous or sticky it is. So, so, for instance, modern computers can just about resolve or compute reasonably a flow of up to Reynolds numbers about 10,000. Those are the biggest machines in the United States, China and Japan. But there are many, many flows in the atmosphere and other places where the Reynolds number takes values of millions. And so we're nowhere near actually being able to compute many, uh, many uh, representations of, of, of turbulent flows. And it's clear that there are mathematical difficulties that we just do not understand. And this program, we want to concentrate some, on some of these problems. Actually, this is the 265th anniversary of the Euler equations and the 200th anniversary of the Navier-Stokes equations. And uh, it is good to check periodically where we stand, what have we learned over all these years, especially by bringing together what is being explored in the most sophisticated experiments and the most high resolution direct numerical simulations on the world's best computers and what advances have been made in the mathematical analysis 
of very difficult questions, for example, uh, do the solutions of the Euler equations uh, blow up in a finite amount of time? Now that problem is still open as is the analogous problem for the Navier-Stokes case. So we thought it is very good to bring together mathematicians along with physicists and engineers to get them to discuss what are the open problems in their fields, to lay out what is understood and what the grand challenge problems are because as was said by Feynman, turbulence is the last great unsolved problem of classical physics. The thing that's fascinating to me about Navier-Stokes and makes it quite unique I think is that there's almost no other physics equation that's valid over such a large range of scales as you were saying, right? I mean, it's very unusual. Usually physics you design an equation and it works in the lab but then in astrophysics you might have to use a different equation and Navier-Stokes is crazy because you can use it for bacteria and you can use it for stars, right? And you can even use it for the intergalactic medium. So it's, it's the, the range of scale is unmatched. And I think that's what makes it such a, a fascinating object for mathematicians because the physicists tell them, well, you can have this equation and for once we guarantee you that this equation, you know, you can hit it with a hammer and it's still going to work, right? And the mathematicians say, okay, well, fine, well, you know, give us uh, 10 years and we'll have it solved, right? And, and the thing that's really surprised everybody in a way is how persistent that question has turned out to be, right? I mean, you would think this foundational equation of physics would just be able to, like, you know, over a long weekend maybe, like, prove what you need to prove about it and, and then go home. And it's the, the resistance of this equation, you know, it's the, the longer it resists, the more tantalizing it becomes. So I think that's been the, the source of the eternal fascination with Matthew Stokes is that, you know, to quote her, uh, colleague Charlie During, who was an original organizer of this meeting, but sadly passed away last year. If, if we can't do this, then then what can we do, right? So there, there's somehow a challenge that's been issued about the Navier-Stokes equation. That it's such a ubiquitous equation that we should be able to understand everything about it. And the fact that we haven't, we haven't come close, is I think the thing that keeps kind of poking at uh, the applied analysis community. And I would add to that. If we, we talk about his sister equation, the Euler equations, in the last 10 years, there have been a whole raft of new solutions. They're called wild solutions of Euler. And they, they were discovered by two mathematicians, Delelis in Geneva and Zekelihidi, collaboratively from Leipzig. And essentially, our co-organizer, Idris Titi, describes them in this way. Say you take a glass of water and you put it on your bedside table and you go and it's just sitting there and you go to sleep and while you're sleeping in the middle of the night the water suddenly starts to go into motion and shake and then after a finite time it just stops. You wake up in the morning and it's just sitting there stationary smiling at you and these wild solutions behave that way. We don't know what they mean, we don't even know if they're physical. They could be the precursors of turbulent states, or maybe maybe they don't represent any known physics. We have no idea. So, so abstract things like this get thrown up, and then we have to see if we can assign some meaning to them. And that's one of the things that we try to do in a program like this. Yeah, perhaps one thing we didn't emphasize is without getting too technical that the Navier-Stokes equations are nonlinear partial differential equations as opposed to equations in many other parts of physics which are linear and it is this nonlinearity which lies at the heart of the mathematical difficulties that are faced in trying to prove uh, various results exactly. Well, what we decided to do for such a big and wide program is to divide the program into roughly four quarters, covering different areas of interest. Uh, and we, we kicked the workshop off with a, a week, a first week in early January of, of 12 distinguished people from around the world. And it was all done online, so it was a hybrid meeting. And we asked them to give their view of where they thought that the turbulence problem stood from their perspective. And that, we thought, worked extremely well. And then we moved into the first quarter of the program, which was more mathematical analysis. 
and we had a workshop in the middle of that um, where it was mainly pure mathematical analysts looking at issues to do with the regularity of the Navier-Stokes equations and these wild solutions of the Euler equations which I described earlier. Another important point that was highlighted in the first workshop was uh, whether we well, that we certainly do not have a theory of what is called multifractality in turbulence. And there were other lectures which covered important issues in wall bounded flows and uh, also in geophysical uh, turbulence. The wall bounded flows were examined in great detail in the fourth workshop we just finished last week. And there was a, a very uh, strong and vigorous scientific interaction between engineers, physicists, and mathematicians in this workshop. Another workshop, which was a third workshop, concentrated on mixing in turbulent flows. Mixing is a very important aspect of turbulent flows, whether it is the spreading of viruses, or the spreading of pollutants, or the formation of planetesimals. And this problem of mixing was addressed both from the point of view of mathematics, which John Liu can cover, and also from the point of view of physics in multiphase flows and other types of flows, and by direct numerical simulations. You want to say something about? Yeah. So the, the workshop on mixing. I mean, some of the mathematical issues. Um, in, in a way, mixing often is it, it can be construed as a simplified version of the turbulence problem, which is very helpful. Um, of course, real mixing involves the full turbulence problem, and etc. But you know, there's a nice simplified formulation of turbulence that we use in mixing, which has proven to be a very nice test bed because people can finally prove some things. And so people have made a lot of progress, for instance, in answering the question of, of course, the classical example is always the cream and the coffee. Um, the question is, there's an interplay between the fluid motion and what's called the molecular diffusivity of the cream, and the 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 nagging question is what happens when you take the molecular diffusivity of the cream to be smaller and smaller? And the belief we understand is that it almost doesn't matter. I should still be able to mix the cream in my coffee because the acceleration is so rapid that it does it almost becomes irrelevant how big this molecular these molecular values are. Um, and so people have made progress very recently into actually exploring that limit the sort of residual diffusion or the anomalous dissipation limit, as it's called, which has its analog in turbulence, but again, in mixing, we can make more progress. There's a beautiful analogy. Have you ever heard Sir Michael Berry's uh, description of a, a, a singular limit? Go cool. on. Yeah. That's a beautiful one. So the idea between the singular limit is, uh, so Euler and Navier-Stokes are different equations. One of them has zero viscosity. The other one has a viscosity, but you take it to zero. And somehow this is not the same. And Michael Berry said, uh, let's say you're eating an apple and you find half of a worm. And that's bad. If you find a quarter of a worm, that's worse. One eighth, one sixteenth, worse. Until you find no worm, and then everything is okay again. So the limit of smaller and smaller pieces of worm that you find in your apple is not at all the same as finding no worm, uh, which is, so, you know, that's the distinction we tried to make here is that it's completely different to take the limit of something going to zero in a singular problem versus actually having that number be zero. I mean, mathematics, those are very different things. One last thing I would like to say, that the fifth workshop will be held in May, and that will concentrate on challenging problems in turbulence, in geophysical and astrophysical flows. So that's another class of problems which are very important. And we look forward to a very exciting workshop there too. Well, most flows in nature, uh, whether it is at the astrophysical scale, geophysical scale, or laboratory scale, they're all turbulent. And uh, so it is uh, very important to understand this. And there are uh, many, many uh, applications, of course, as you can well imagine, one, for example, is drag reduction. How should you reduce the drag on an aircraft, for example? Then there is this important issue which we just mentioned about mixing. How 
there's turbulence in a fluid, aid in the mixing of pollutants, of irises, of aerosols, um, dust particles, etc. And that also is an area of great uh, importance. And there's a rapidly developing area of bacterial turbulence, which is defined, described by slightly different but related hydrodynamical equations. And that governs the behavior of uh, you know, turbulent-like patterns in bacterial flows. So all these are potential areas of uh, application. I think Jean-Luc can... Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe I want to say a bit more about drag reduction because I think that's a fascinating topic. I mean, so in pipelines, right, in oil pipelines, they put uh, a small amount of polymers, so these little extensible molecules, like little rubber bands. And the and this is really tiny little amounts, like parts per million of these molecules. And the surprising thing is that this reduces the drag. You would think that if you add little rubber bands to your fluid, it should somehow, it can't do anything else but increase the drag on the fluid, the drag being the energy necessary to push the fluid through the pipe. But the shocking discovery, maybe 40 years ago or 30 years ago, was that it actually reduces the drag. And it took us forever to understand this. It's been a very gradual process. And, you know, the, the logic or the, the, the reasoning seems to be that so you suppress some of the worst motion of turbulence because now they're constrained by this elasticity in the fluid. And by, by preventing these bursting effects from happening near the boundaries of the pipes, you remove the cost of accelerating the fluid in the pipe because drag is due to the fact that if a blob of fluid moves to the center, you have to accelerate that blob to go along with the fluid and acceleration costs energy. So if you can keep that blob from moving around too much laterally in the pipe, it actually costs you less energy to move fluid in the pipe. And so that's probably saved, you know, untold hundreds of millions of dollars just in, you know, energy bills for uh, companies to push uh, petroleum through pipes. Do we know who first put the polymers in it without knowing why it would work? Or yeah. It would work? yeah, exactly. exactly. It was discovered experimentally like many things. Around yeah. 1940s, I think, if I'm not mistaken. By, and I'm forgetting the name of the person. But, and then there were huge studies in engineering, the maximum drag, asymptote, uh, etc. Or minimum drag, sorry. So it's, it's a very big problem. I think, if I'm not mistaken, even the Alaska pipeline uses it. You know, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, of course, on an airplane, drag reduction is achieved by things like suction. You try. You would like to control the airflow around the wing. You don't, can't put polymers in the air, right? That doesn't help. Um, but uh, by actuating near the wing, they figured out that they can modify what's called the boundary layer flowing around the wing. And by molding the properties of the boundary layer, you can affect the drag properties. Which the is airplane. what these winglets these little winglets on the end of the wings of modern planes are that they they modify the airflow just enough that you get you get a, a, only a one percent saving gives you a huge saving on fuel across the world. So things like drag reduction is extremely important economically. Turbulence covers such a wide area that, for instance, in our wall-bounded flow workshop last week, most of the participants were from aeronautics, mechanical engineering departments, physics departments. Uh, in, a, in our fourth um, quarter on, on oceanographic, on geophysical flows, in fact, many people are from oceanographic atmospheric institutions. Uh, so we cover a very, very wide range of specific university and laboratory areas, not just mathematics departments or physics departments. It's this sort of vast spectrum of disciplines. So certainly we expect a lot of new collaborations also. I could give you anecdotal evidence uh, between many of us, but let me not do that. But I really think there will be a lot of collaboration, uh, not only between mathematicians, but also mathematicians and physicists and engineers and so on. So we look forward to that.